Hey guys, welcome. This is Dr. Dilip, your internal medicine educator at an academy. I'm going to start our medicine discussion with cardiovascular system. And in the cardiovascular system, we are going to first start with the ECG basics. This is a very important uh, lecture because the idea that you are going to get from this lecture is something that you are going to carry forward throughout the cardiovascular system discussion. And to start with, I need to tell you the difference between an electrocardiogram versus an electrogram. So, electrocardiogram is basically a form of recording that you are going to obtain by placing electrodes on the surface of the body. That is what we call it as electrocardiogram. That's why famously it is called a surface ECG. And electrogram, on the other hand, is the recording of the potential of the heart by placing electrodes directly over the heart or directly in the heart. That is what we call as electrogram. As you can understand, electrogram, of course, is going to be more sensitive compared to that of electrocardiogram. How can you translate that into clinically relevant information? For say, ECG will not be able to pick up very small potentials and all because it is not sensitive. In the sense, ECG will miss out on the nodal firing and all, like SA nodal depolarization, AV nodal depolarization and all will not be picked up properly by the surface ECG. But it can be picked up by the electrogram. For example, electrogram can pick up SA nodal firing, AV nodal firing, his bundle firing. That and all can be picked up by the electrogram, but not by the surface ECG. Now going to the common waveforms that you see in the ECG. We all know we have P, Q, R, S complex and then T wave. Optionally, you can have a U wave, the EKG. But let us first talk about the P wave. You all know that P wave is going to be generated due to atrial depolarization. That's the reason for development of the P wave. And physiologically, the SA node firing is the one that is going to result in atrial depolarization. That is what is going to produce the P wave. And many people falsely equate SA nodal firing to P wave and that should not be done. Remember, it is only atrial depolarization that is going to result in P wave, not the SA nodal firing. What are the important clinical implications of this understanding? There are some areas where you can have atrial depolarization, but SA node will be silent. But still you get the P wave. Say for example, in AV and RT, there is a kind of a re-entrant tachyrhythmia in the AV node that produces atrial depolarization. But SA node will be silent in that situation, but still you get a P wave. On the other hand, there are some situations where atrium will not depolarize at all. There will be atrial standstill, but SA node will still be firing, but you don't get the P wave because atrium is not firing. Best example for that condition is hyperkalemia, where there will be complete atrial paralysis. Atrium cannot depolarize at all, but your SA node will be active to some extent. So it will still produce impulses, but that will not be picked up in the surfaces. So we will not get the P wave. Okay. What are the best leads? To look at uh, the P wave. One is lead to, of course, one of the best gold standard leads to look for the P wave. In the lead to, P wave should be erect and upright. If it is negative, it still indicates there is atrial depolarization, but we can say it is coming from a source apart from the SA node. If it's depolarizing due to SA nodal source, then P wave should be erect and upright only. Inverted probably, you can think about an ectopic atrial focus apart from SA node that is firing the atrium. And another lead to look for the P wave is lead V1. Another very good lead to look for the P wave. We are going to see biphasic configuration of the P wave. Basically, the initial positive deflection is due to right atrial depolarization and the negative deflection is due to left atrial depolarization. And looking at the morphology of the P wave, you can get a lot of information. Plus, looking at the Length as well as height of the P wave also will give you a lot of information. For example, in chamber hypertrophies like atrial hypertrophies or atrial enlargements, your length or height of the P wave in lead to will be affected. For example, if you have a very wide P wave, I'll tell you the cutoffs in a while, but if you have a very wide P wave, you can think about left atrial enlargement. On the other hand, if you see a very tall P wave, lead to, you can think about a right atrial enlargement. Of course, this wide P waves are called as P mitral and this tall P waves will be called as P pulmonary. We'll talk about that in a while. And similarly, in lead V1, there is a right atrial enlargement. You're going to have a prominent positive deflection than negative deflection. You're going to have a prominent negative deflection than positive deflection. You can think about left atrial enlargement also. 
and then coming to the second part after the p wave that is the pr segment but pr segment is not that important uh, as far as your exams are concerned but the pr interval is now you need to understand the differences between an interval and a segment what is the difference between an interval and a segment interval is not isoelectric listen it includes some waveforms in between not isoelectric so what is isoelectric means it's a flat line so this is an isoelectric line this is an isoelectric line so intervals are technically not isoelectric which means they will include some undulations waveforms with them segments on the other hand are isoelectric and generally intervals are measured in the horizontal direction in the sense in the x axis not in the y axis it means intervals can be prolonged or shortened whereas segments are measured in the vertical y axis which means segments can be elevated or depressed that's how you measure the segments so as you can see now this is the pr segment not the pr interval on the other hand this is the pr interval so you can understand that pr interval must include p wave in it the common mistake that you do in exam that you calculate the pr interval without including the p wave pr interval should include p wave and what is the normal pr interval the normal pr interval is somewhere around 0.12 to 0.2 seconds or i can say 120 to 200 milliseconds that is a normal pr interval and what is the reason for pr interval in the first place the reason why you get pr interval is because of the av nodal delay let me show you an example you draw a hypothetical heart and let me divide the heart into four chambers the right atrium here the left atrium here you have the right ventricle here and you have the left ventricle and you have the sa node you have the av node and then you have the his bundle bundle branches and then it's going to end up in Purkinje fibers initially the SA node physiologically speaking it's going to fire and that's going to result in atrial depolarization and p wave and this impulse immediately it's going to anyway reach the av node and once it reaches the av node once it hits the av node the impulse is not going to immediately transfer into bundle of his and the bundle branches it's going to be held within the av node for a while and this is what we called as av nodal delay the normal av nodal delay so why there should be av nodal delay because av node is calcium dependent depolarization second main important reason is the av nodal fibers are arranged in series and not parallel there will be little gap junctions lesser gap junctions the av nodal uh, myocytes that is the reason why they are not conducting that faster second they are calcium dependent which is basically slow sodium dependent depolarization are faster compared to calcium dependent depolarization that's why av node is slow lethargic and that is the reason why it's going to get translated into something called as AV nodal delay, and that is the reason why you are going to get the PR interval in the first place. Right? So, if you are going to have any problem in the PR interval, like say prolonged PR or short PR, you can say either you're having problem in the AV node or there is something that is bypassing the AV node. Then only you can get problem in the PR interval. So I can say if there is going to be a prolonged PR interval going to be a prolonged PR interval it must be due to some AV nodal issue some AV nodal problem AV node is not functioning properly that's why the PR interval is getting prolonged like for example a first degree heart block we'll talk about that in a while and apart from that there could be short PR also where you can get short PR there are plenty of reasons tachycardia you can get a short PR but the classic cause for short PR exams is WPW syndrome why because in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, you're going to have some accessory pathways. These accessory pathways are called as bundle of Kent. Bundle of Kent. This is accessory pathway. And what happens? You have a bundle of Kent. And in case if the bundle of Kent is able to uh, pass the impulses anti-gradely, there are different types of accessory pathways within the WPW syndrome like something can conduct anterogradely, something can conduct only retrogradely. There are some pathways which can conduct both anterogradely and retrogradely. And there are some aberrant pathways which may not conduct at all. There are multiple types. But let us assume 
that this bundle of kent is able to conduct anti grade leak so in the sense once the impulse reaches your uh, bundle of kent simultaneously as that of uh, av node av node is going to hold the impulse but bundle of kent is not going to hold the impulse because bundle of kent lacks the properties of the av node and it will be sodium dependent depotation so it doesn't have any av node delay and it's going to transmit the impulses immediately to the ventricles because there is no av nodal delay here you are going to get a short pr classic cause wpw syndrome and why you need a av nodal delay physiologically speaking once your atrium is going to fire your ventricles should not fire simultaneously rather your ventricles should fire sequentially not simultaneously so if the ventricle also fires simultaneously and if there is no av nodal delay when both atrium and if the ventricles are contracting together there is no use of atrium contracting because anyway ventricular pressures are high and it's going to close the tricuspid and the mitral valves so all the blood that is present in the atrium will regurgitate back into the veins which is totally useless so that is the reason after complete atrial contraction only your ventricles should start contracting so there should be sequential contraction from atrium to ventricles rather than simultaneous contraction of atrium and ventricles together so av node ensures that the av node will delay ensures that that's why av node delay is very very important physiologically another reason why av node delay becomes important is the fact that in atrial arrhythmias when you have an atrial arrhythmia for example say atrial fibrillation your av node is the one that protects the ventricles from getting affected by these atrial arrhythmias say atrial fibrillation for example where atrium producing haphazard impulses at the rate of approximately 500 if all finer impulses are going to get transmitted to the ventricles imagine what will be the situation you might result in ventricular fibrillation and you may die but av node will not allow that av node delay will ensure that uh, not all finer impulses are going to get transmitted it will transmit only approximately 120 or 150 so that still you are alive despite the fact that you are having atrial arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation so whatever stupidity that atria does we have av node to protect your ventricles so we can say av node is a kind of a gatekeeper the ventricle